Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 52 of Circle of Fellows. This is the monthly broadcast panel discussion where four IABC fellows and a moderator, me, also an IABC fellow, uh, tackle a topic of interest to communicators. And this month, that topic is how to be a good, valued advisor uh, to your organization. Uh, that has a variety of different dimensions to it and even different meanings to it. And we will explore those. A uh, little housekeeping before we start. I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves in just a minute. Before that, though, I want to let you know that we will take your questions in real time. And there are two, count them, two ways to do that. One is on Twitter. Just use the hashtag COF52. Uh, and the other is to use the chat feature. If you're watching this directly on YouTube, there is a chat feature, and we'll see that right here on StreamYard, new feature of StreamYard. And in fact, if you do that, I'll be able to click on your question and show it on the screen. This, this service Ooh. just keeps getting better and better. Um, so with that, I hope you bring your questions to us. Uh, let's introduce the panel, and uh, I'm going to go just left to right, as I usually do, uh, starting with Jim Schaefer. Jim? Hi there, I'm Jim Schaefer. I, for 20 years, was with uh, Towers uh, Willis Watson now, but Towers Parent at that time, and led the uh, change management uh, consulting practice. I uh, left Towers, Towers and uh, started my own firm a little over 20 years ago. Uh, we focus on helping organizations uh, uh, perform at higher levels. Require, and that what's required of that, of course, is uh, employees have to be engaged and turned on about what they're able to do and the leaders need to lead in a proper way and and uh, we focus very very much on um, quantitative kinds of improvements for our clients. Great next is Angela. Hi I'm Angela Senecas. I currently have my own consulting firm. We focus on research and measurement for corporate communications but in the past I've had many different communication jobs of uh, including vice president of communication where I probably had the most experience advising and coaching our CEO. And I also have a master's degree in leadership. So I also learned a little bit of theoretical stuff about why what I was doing was working or not working. And moving clockwise, we move to Amanda. Uh, good evening. I'm Amanda Hamilton Atwell from Pretoria in South Africa. And, um, you know, in my previous life, before I started my own business, I worked with the National Productivity Institute, and I focused on the impact of communication on productivity and, uh, you know, how people misunderstanding each other can have a significant impact on the performance of a company. Um, the past 20 years, I've had my own company, and we also focus on a, a lot on research and measurement, but we also do training and strategic planning for companies. And uh, I work with a lot of corporate companies, uh, glo global corporate companies, um, and it's always interesting to see how they uh, differ from their, you know, their views differ from how you deal with measurement and mentoring and coaching than when you work with a smaller local company. So, and I have a doctorate in communication science. So, Angela, I learned a lot about a little uh, in the communication. And uh, that's what, the, you know, that's a problem with doing a doctorate. You know a lot about very little. Yeah. And um, I'm always, uh, you know, fascinated by the discussions of these, these panels. Me too. And that'll take us to our second Jim on the panel, Jim Lukashevsky. Good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. Um, my business is trouble. We don't generally meet unless uh, you're somewhere uh, south of where you're supposed to be. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, it's an interesting practice since uh, I'm involved in coaching people who coach people uh, and coach people myself. And the topic today is a really important one for really each of us as we go forward. But um, I'm going to talk about some of the things that I've experienced and have learned about doing this for, I'm, I'm with Jim, I'm doing this like almost hard to say for, 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 for 40 years. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, it's been an interesting life and I've, I've, I've got to pal around with folks like those on the panel today and others and, uh, and help people out of jams. Terrific. And I'm Shell Holtz. I am Director of Internal Communications at WebCore. We are a uh, $2 billion 
uh, commercial builder in the San Francisco Bay Area. That's where we're headquartered. We build all over California. Uh, and I've been doing this for about two years. I was an independent consultant for 21 years before that, just got really fried on the travel and decided to settle down again and, and return to the client side. Uh, where I am doing some some coaching and uh, advising with the leadership of the organization. So we should have a pretty good discussion. And just to show you how this commenting on, on YouTube works, uh, we, we have a comment that has already come in, and I'm just going to make it appear here. That's Brian Kilgore, um, who's managed to get this working. Uh, the first one, I should say, uh, and uh, offers us all a good day. You can all see that, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, perfect, man. This service check rocks. This is uh, an unsolicited um, endorsement for StreamYard if you want to do this kind of broadcasting and recording. And, and the other new feature of StreamYard, by the way, and we haven't taken advantage of it yet, is that you can broadcast simultaneously to YouTube and uh, Facebook Live and a couple of other services. And they even hook into a service that lets you broadcast to proprietary channels concurrently. So um, it's Ooh. incredibly cheap, I think. IEBC ponies up 120 a year for this service. So that's dollars, not 120,000. So, uh, we're going to take advantage of the service right now and uh, kick off our conversation. Uh, we, we talk about being an advisor. We talk about being a coach. Uh, some people might talk about being a mentor. Uh, what do you see as the differences and where should uh, communicators be focusing their attention? Where what, what should we be trying to do when we engage with the senior leadership of the company? Well, I'm sorry. I, um, I, I really developed over the years a specific philosophy about doing this work, and um, it goes something like this. Uh, uh, all problems that managers and leaders have are management and leadership problems before any other kind of problem, including communication. Uh, what I learned over the years, and I, my colleagues can comment as well. You know, if you if you start someplace else, uh, other someplace other than where the manager's issues are, or the the person you're coaching, or mentoring, or counseling, um, you're going to have trouble getting to the the, the place you want to get at, at the same time. I think this is a different way of thinking about how we approach this whole process, and we have to put ourselves in their shoes first. And keep them there, so we so we can sort of start together and get through the process. So there are other elements of it, but that's my fundamental thinking, and I, I fits into any, however you call, however you call yourself uh, or what you're doing. It seems to me. Well, I think too, when you help a certain executive with their own business issues, and they see that it gets done much better with your help and your advice, what they do then is that they recommend you to some of their colleagues, and so it's sort of a a passing on kind of thing that. They say, you know, if you've got this problem, you might want to talk to this person because they really helped me through this business issue. So completely agree with you, Jim. Yeah, I, I agree with you, too. The, the two kinds of coaching, mentoring, whatever you want to call it, I, I think it's essentially whatever you do uh, that it's important. That's important, not necessarily what you call it. But um, I've worked with people who are uh, being placed into a large manufacturing plant uh, because of uh, two deaths and an amputation that occurred and many, many OSHA recordables and the head senior vice president of manufacturing asked if I would work with uh, a 34 year old guy who is a very, very uh, strong people person and leader. He probably was one of the most enjoyable um, consulting engagements that I've had because we were able to turn the, the entire operation around in every every uh, conceivable metric. The, the other piece of it is, and I enjoy this very much, is working with communication practitioners when we're going through changes in their organization and having them work with me and watch me and let me watch and ca counsel them so that they can become uh, good teachers, mentors, whatever. So I've, I've kind of had it at both ends of the spectrum, the leadership side and the communication people side where they work directly with me. I can talk a little bit later maybe about the kinds of things that I've done with them. Um, for me, you know, as a communication professional, um, I think there are two sides to this coin. Um, there are always two sides to a coin, isn't there? <laughs> um, I think that, you know, in some ways, a communication professional will um, mentor 
um, or advise a senior leader on uh, how to communicate, what, it, what are the best ways to communicate in a specific situation. And for me, that is the advisory part, the mentoring part, where you as a, a competent communicator must uh, guide them. But then, on the other hand, when they come to you and they say, well, I have this communication problem, I really, you know, in the meeting I have this problem, that uh, for me the coaching part then will come in that you ask them the question, so why do you have a problem? What kind of problem do you have? Uh, what do you see as the way forward? Uh, because the... Um, and there's a very uh, interesting article in the latest Harvard Business Review um, on coaching. And uh, I like the differentiation that they make between um, having a, a mentor, which is a, a competent, skillful person, and being uh, in the role of a coach where you, where you get the other person to, to get the the solution from their own experience and build their own competence through um, their own experience. Amanda, one of the most, go ahead, Angela. I was just going to say one of the most important questions I think we can ask them is they call us in to maybe help them say something in a better way. Mm -hmm. We have to get them off of what it is they want to say, and we can help them understand that they need to think about what outcomes do they want employees or other stakeholders yeah. to actually have as a result of the communication. And that then yeah. will completely change the what and the how of yeah. how they're going to go about this. But that's one thing we bring in is we really understand the different stakeholders and see yeah. what those outcomes might be. And I think that's a really good question. Let's go ahead, Jim. I, I agree with you, Amanda, uh, Amanda and Angela. And I, I think one of the things uh, I was thinking about this this morning when I was on my my early morning walk, and I was thinking about a, a young woman that I was working with at a time. She was 34 years old. We were up in upstate New York, and we were able to drive every morning and evening from the uh, hotel to the plant and back. And we had lots and lots of conversations. And, and to one of the things that that uh, I try to do with the, the particularly younger people is I try to ask a lot of questions, too, because of the two reasons that you all gave. But the other piece is, is that, that if I ask a question about the culture of the organization and this and what do you think about this and that sort of thing, they take ownership of that because it's now mm -hmm. their idea. Uh, I was just asking the, the right questions yeah. for them yeah. to be able to respond because now they own that solution and the, the way that they're mm -hmm. going forward. One of my clients, uh, when I was self-employed about 15 years ago, was uh, Sears, uh, when Sears was still a viable retailer uh, and not on the brink of um, extinction. But uh, a brilliant communicator named Ron Culp was uh, running the department, and the internet was fairly new, and they were setting up the internal communications site on the internet. And it was Ron's idea, and this was actually before I got there, I learned about this um, as I came in as a consultant, was he said, let's not just put who we are on the home page. Let's put uh, a little uh, wizard on the home page so that when people contact us because they want to communicate something, uh, we actually take control of the start of the process. Uh, Angela, this gets to exactly what you were talking about. Uh, rather than wait for them to pick up the phone and call and say, we need a brochure or we need a mm -hmm. website or whatever it is they think they need, uh, it starts with what change are you trying to accomplish? Who is your audience? Um, and walks them through those questions. And then that got submitted to communications, which would get back to them with a proposal on how to approach that. That's not exactly coaching, but I think it gets to that uh, notion of changing the mindset from thinking in terms of a tactic to thinking in terms of an outcome. I think in the in the crisis business part of the business, the, <clears throat> the biggest issue is... Um, is who are the victims and what do they need? Uh, because it's the victims who actually drive how these scenarios play out. It isn't any it isn't any fancy PR work either. It's really understanding <clears throat> who has who has been who is suffering as a result of whatever the circumstance is. Often it's had they have uh, circumstances that involve both internal aspects of the company itself and external aspects. So, and part of part of it really is. Uh, it, it's very leadership driven, uh, leader centric kind of work. And, uh, and these people over the years demonstrate patterns when things go bad uh, that uh, tend to follow 
and get them into trouble. The, 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 the most, most common pattern is why are we saying anything? Uh, why are we, why are we, you need, it'll go away in a couple of days. All these things blow over. Uh, and I've learned that silence is the most toxic communication strategy you can attempt to have. Um, and there are, there are patterns though of response to various scenarios. And that's what I tend to look for. What is the scenario that we're experiencing here? And, and have that sort of leadership discussion before we talk about communications. Because quite often, the folks who lead organizations are there because they think they're great communicators. And um, I always ask the question, you know, does anybody in the audience work for somebody who thinks they're a bad communicator? And uh, it gets a good laugh, but it makes the point. Almost everybody you're dealing with in a position of authority believes they're there because they communicate. And unlike talking to your accountant or your uh, engineers and the rest of it, where you don't know ha don't have a lot of knowledge and they, they really don't have a lot of knowledge of communications, the person running the place thinks he or she is a great communicator. And instead of learning from you, their mind is having a debate with you about whether you're as smart as they are and all that sort of stuff is going on. So if you start with communications, you're going to go down a pathway that, that is not very productive. So you really have to start where this person is suffering and what are the key issues and <clears throat> questions they face. And I think in this situation, <clears throat> they are looking for specific recommendations that involve both leadership and management and ultimately communications. Yeah, I would have to add that I think it's not just leaders who think they're great communicators. Everybody thinks they're a great communicator. I, I was uh, working on some uh, a very tactical uh, announcement the other day. And I had to go uh, reach out to IT to get some information of, on what this was all about. And I get a note back explaining everything. Uh, and the guy in IT added at the end, he says, don't include the technical information in the article because your employees don't care. Uh, and, you know, my, my answer to that was um, yeah, the next time you're, you know, upgrading the network, I'll tell you what to do because it's inappropriate. <laughs> you know? uh, I, I, I think I can figure out as a communicator what the audience wants to know about. You know, so uh, everybody is, is inclined to tell you how to communicate uh, their Ooh. message. Um, but I think most communicators are brought into an organization, particularly perceived at the leadership level as order takers, right? You're the ones who crank out the emails and the newsletters and the web pages and, and coordinate the town hall meetings, uh, do it. And this is what we want to say, write an article about this, get an email out about that. Uh, how do you start to change the mindset of leaders to be you know, accepting of your, uh, advice uh, and, and, and your counsel. Well, I think one of the things, one of the things is creating successes. I was, I was talking this morning with somebody who was saying that uh, she was having a very difficult time with uh, a lot of employees who couldn't get information that they needed when they need it. And as a result of that, um, you know, they were very, very frustrated and she's the communication person. And she said, I'm frustrated over it. What do I do about this? How do I go about getting the right information to them? And, I, and she said, and how do I prove that it's going to uh, generate a, an acceptable gain? And I said, I would not worry at first about not having the right information at the right time. What I'd worry about first is what is this causing us in terms of information that is not going to people who need that information to drive better results. And so I said, don't worry about the process at this point, worry about the results you're trying to create. Is it an on-time delivery problem because customers aren't getting the, what they need in time or is it something else? And so she said, I never thought of it that way. Uh, she said, I think that my CEO is gonna be much happier knowing that I'm approaching it from a results-based approach versus a process-based result. Now, I think one of the things that we could do is not just be waiting for them to call us in for any purpose, whether it's for advice or for a message or a channel. But I think part of what we should be doing is that constant listening to all of our stakeholders, because if we're doing that correctly, we're going to start hearing about issues before they become the types of crises that Jim was talking about. And so what you end up doing is you can, you know, I did this when I was very young at the Chicago Tribune, 
we were going to be building a brand new production facility and I didn't know what to write about because I was brand new to the company. So I started talking to all the different people and I started seeing all the different questions and issues they had. And while some of them were the things that I knew that leaders were expecting, some of them were out of completely out of left field. When I put that together and I presented it to first my boss, he had me present it to the task force planning the move. And some of the things that we discovered resulted in changes to the blueprints before the facility was actually being built. And those, some of those things ended up having much longer repercussions. So right from that point, I was being seen as a strategist because I was bringing them issues waiting rather than waiting to be brought in when they thought there was an issue. And that's another way to really change their mind as to who you are and why you're there. But um, Angela, I, I agree with you. And I think that um, one of the first things that the communication professionals uh, should have is confidence to ask the questions without permission. Because mm. if you waited for permission to go and ask the questions, you probably would have been stopped. Say, well, oh. none of your business. I did get and, yelled uh, at. I got yelled at by one of the vice presidents. And after he finished yelling at me, he said, so what did you find out? Yeah. <laughs> so I knew I was and, okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I, find, I often find it when I say to people, you know, we produce these newsletters. We produce these videos, all these wonderful things. It's just great stuff. But then what? Please go and ask the people, because we outside the organization, go and ask the people just three questions. These are the three questions. And then they get such a lot of pushback on asking these questions. And I said, well, don't, you know, I once worked with a Jewish woman and she said, it's much easier to get, uh, uh, to get um, excused than to get um, uh, permission. So just go and do it, and then ask for uh, to be you know to be uh, for ask apologies later. But um, and but the a communication professional should have the the courage to ask the questions, and then with that knowledge to go and ask the same questions to the leadership, and then in a way guide their thinking to what they have what the communication professional um has heard when she, they were asking these questions uh, i, I, I want to share uh, an observation jackie Sargent has uh, written that we we all have and i need a brochure story uh taking people from a tactic to a strategy uh, i would hope so um uh, yeah, I, I started a new job, uh, this was many years ago, at, at a pharmaceutical company, and the executive team had already made a decision that they were going to implement this um, shareholder value enhancement strategy, SVE, shareholder value enhancement uh, strategy that um, great companies like Enron uh, implemented. Uh, and, uh, you know, I walked in the door and basically they said, we've made this decision, communicate it. And uh, I so desperately wanted to say, you can't communicate this effectively. There is no good way to tell people that you have to get up in the morning and, and be excited, uh, to enhance the value of shares for the owners who have lots and lots of, uh, shares of, of stock. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things they said is, oh, uh, our employees participate in employee stock ownership program. And I said, nobody's retiring based on their ESOP. Um, <laughs> but that's the type of thing where I think you can walk in the door if I had been there a month earlier while they were still making the decision and uh, had a shot at influencing that. If, if it had been a decision about pharmaceutical pricing or market direction or announcing some strategic shift in the way they uh, price, uh, I didn't know anything about the industry. So uh, my question is, how do you get up to speed quickly enough that you have credibility uh, going to leadership to share the kind of advice that, that, that you have, the kind of uh, counsel that you can provide about how to communicate something so that you get the outcome that you're looking for? I, I, think that, I would say, assuming you have the credibility to be in the room, one makes the assumption that you're there for that you're there for a reason, but I'm sort of, I, I think about the outcome of the advice that we have to give. And um, uh, I, the difference between us and those who make the decisions and run the place is that they really wanna do that. And uh, I think in often we come in with 
with ideas uh, or maybe even a single idea that we think is really a powerful approach. And what I found uh, to answer in a way your earlier question, how do you get the credibility to be listened to? I always try to provide the, these people with options. I don't necessarily bill myself as a solution finder, but more of an option developer so that they can make the decisions that determine their own future. And the three the three choices are generally doing nothing, which I call the 0% solution. Then there's doing something, which is 100% solution. Then there's 125% solution, which is doing something more. But the idea is um, to stay in the game and to help them make the choices that, are, that, that make the most sense to them, as opposed to what I often see, and that is a prepared program that is then we're selling the program instead of selling the, the, the decision the leader has to make um, to, to keep the company on course or get it co course corrected or solve the issue that they're dealing with. So it's just a different approach, but it's, it's one that allows you to be asked back because very few people are offering multiple opportunities. Most people, most staff people, especially in our profession, tend to come in with a well-defined and maybe even well-researched and resourced idea. But then when they're asked the first question, um, they have a problem. So I always think of it in terms of these these three levels of thinking or three levels of choice making, which they're going to have to do anyway. I agree with you, Tim. I think uh, giving options is very important. And, and I would think that over uh, the years that I have been working with clients, uh, I do that an awful lot. Uh, I try to provide them with information based on what they've described as their problem so that I can understand what the root cause is and help them focus on uh, eliminating that root cause rather than just throwing something at them. And so what I try to do is make it very, very clear that I'm taking somewhat of an analytical approach uh, and that I'm probably going to come back to you with some options that you can consider. I, have find cli I find clients very welcoming to that kind of an approach. I think back to your question, Shell, on how do you learn your organization to get that credibility? When I was back in the corporate world, um, one of the things that I did is, of course, you do focus groups to sort of talk to people. But what's even more valuable is to actually shadow them in their jobs, whether that's sitting in the call center and listening into what they do, or in one case, we had a home IV nursing company. And I did calls with the nurses. I actually watched what they did, which ended up being really useful because one of the first things my CEO and CFO asked me to do, one of the, the, the requests they had for an order, was uh, they had discovered that nursing was costing too much money once managed care came in. And so they wanted me to do a financial literacy campaign to teach nurses about profit and loss so they would make fewer unnecessary visits. And of course, I said, no. Um, because that's really not going to work. It was back to what are you trying to achieve? You're trying to achieve fewer nursing visits that are unnecessary. I said, here's what I've learned on how they do their jobs, where I've seen best practices, le less good practices. And instead, I worked with the nursing VP so that at the very next week's staff meetings, they asked nurses to do two different things in the way they did their day-to-day -day job that matched the best practices I saw. And they were both good for patient care. They had nothing to do with talking about a business problem or a strategy or financial literacy. We asked them to do two things that were better for patient care and along the way it reduced unnecessary visits. So that's that was a really useful thing. You have to really understand what it is that your employees do and how a particular message might work or not work with them so you can make a much more useful recommendation that actually achieves the business goal. Sometimes without even letting the employees or other stakeholders know that there was a goal at all. Yeah, I mentioned this uh, person uh, up in upstate New York. You, you just reminded me of this, that uh, well, we, we worked together. We, we, every morning we had and evening, we had to drive from the hotel about 20 miles to the manufacturing operation where we were working. And one morning on the way down there, she said, you know, I want to find out if, how much our employees know uh, what the culture is at our in our company and at this plant. And I said, well, how are you going to do that? She says, I think I need to just ask them some questions. And I said, what questions you can ask them? She said, I'm going to ask them what the culture is like here. <laughs> and I said, well, that's one way to do it. Um, what do you think you're going to get in terms of answers? Well, they should know it because we've been putting out all kinds of videos and brochures and stuff that talk about the culture. And so we 
went into the uh, manufacturing plant. We went to about four or five employees in various different departments, and she asked that question: uh, "What do you, What do you think the culture is like here?" And they were all perplexed. You know, like what, she got two heads or what? And so the employees walked away, and she said, "What am I doing wrong?" I said, "Well, what if you ask? How do you get ahead around here?" She said, "But that's not the culture. Let's try it." How do you get a head around here? And she started asking that question and they started defining the culture for that organization. She would never have known that had we not had that arrangement where I could help her understand better some of the things that would help her be more successful. She tells that story even today. And that was probably about 20 years ago. Well, one thing that occurs to me is that it, it, it strikes me that everybody that we are talking about here in the communication role is probably the senior most communicator in the organization. If, if you are a frontline communicator, uh, probably in a larger organization where there's a full staff, um, what is, how, how do you go about developing the chops to be able to provide this kind of strategic advice? Um, particularly if you really never get in front of the, the CEO or, you know, another senior leader, because that's what your boss's boss's boss does. I think by, by sharing uh, successes is, is a good, good start. Uh, in other words, if you're talking with one of the communication people, you're working with them uh, to, to spend time about uh, what you did for this company and this company, and here's how they took, what approach they took. And that enables them to have some options to be able to suggest to their leadership. But I think there's there's nothing better than have having good successes, whether it's around safety or quality, or cost reduction, whatever it may be. And to be able to do the kind of work that generates those kinds of successes versus communication successes, which oftentimes can be pretty soft, touchy feely. I think you can also start by practicing with just supervisors and managers on projects where you're already meeting them. So you don't have to do it with the high risk executives. You can start small or let's say you're volunteering for some organization. You can start with the heads of those organizations you volunteer for. So you practice, make mistakes, learn and move upward. I like that. And uh, I think uh, for me, it's also documenting your lessons because, uh, you know, in, eventually we forget all these lessons that we learn. So I advise the, the younger people that I work with, just keep a notebook and write down, I did this and this was the impact of that. Um, because eventually you get so busy and just when you have a quiet moment, just go back and read through these things. It's like going to a conference, you hear these things that you actually no, but you tend to forget them. So keep track of your successes and uh, build on your successes um, for future. I, uh, I actually ask these questions as of, in my case, mostly senior executives. What are you looking for in the person walking in the door? And why, why, does, why does one seem to work better for you than the, another work better? And, and I, I get to see, I think as most of us senior practitioners do, a lot of people give advice. And, and there's, there's, a, there's sort of a standard list of things that I hear from these senior people, something to think about. And then the list goes like this. The first thing they want is candor. They, whoever's walking in the door, they want, I define candor as truth with an attitude delivered like right now. Um, and sometimes I'll get a reaction from uh, someone else I'm working with. Well, you don't know the boss around here. He not, he's not interested in hearing anything that doesn't move in his or her direction, so to speak. But my experience is, People who, who are genuinely leading the place want the straight, the straight dope. They want to know. Uh, they want to know essentially what to do next. That's really what what the key role of the senior advisor is. Because and, and I learned this in a situation in, my, in the early days. I was part of a group in the interview to to help a, a senior manager become the spokesperson for a company, and uh, it, was, it was really the senior person, very well known guy in town, as a matter of fact. Um, but he'd never done this before, so. Uh, he decided to have his staff window the, the possibilities down to four people. I made the final four, you might say. And um, you got 15 minutes with this guy, and then he made up his mind. So I'm in his office, which is huge, top floor. It it's, it's actually has four window walls. It just pops out of the building yeah. itself. And so you walk in this office with 14-foot mahogany doors, and 
in my in my case, when someone introduces me and says Mr. Lukashevsky is here, I get a little nervous because no one makes my name says my name right. <laughs> it's, you know, it's looks as whiskey, whatever. So so anyhow, so the secretary, I was there early. I, I'm in the door. The secretary uh, hands. Take, brings me in and says, Mr. Lukashevsky is here, hands, me a, hands him a piece of paper with a paragraph on it. I can read it. It said James E. Lukashevsky at the top. It's his briefing for this 15-minute block of his time. So he looks at it, hands it back to her. She leaves and the, the door is closed behind me. Boom. And I'm with the guy in the room. And you, you have to talk about you have to talk about the window, the, the view, because it, you know, Minnesota's pretty flat and when you're 30 stories up, it's pretty high. So anyway, so he, he's so used to this. When I talk about the view, he grabs my arm and he takes me around to each window and tells me why that view is important to the history of the company, okay? All the while, I'm supposed to be talking to him about myself and what I'm going to do. We get to the third window and my brain is screaming, Jim, Jim, say something that matters because the next wall has the door. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so I, so I said, let me ask you a question. Uh, we're back to questions again. Um, uh, you know... <clears throat> T tell me why you got this job. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you mean? How, how, how do people trust you? I know you've been with the company a long time, but and you know a lot about it in the community. Um, and he said, well, I, I got this job uh, with a, very, a big majority of voters of the board because they think they trust my judgment for at least half the decisions they have to make. Uh, I think they, 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 they trust my judgment, and there's 28 people, 28 story floors of people that keep me from making a big mistake for the second half of those decisions. He said, but the problem with the job is that nobody told me about was that last bunch of questions. There's no one to help me with the answer. I don't, I really don't know what to do next. And it was from that series of questions that I actually, you know, I secured the job, so to speak. And I, I still did it within 15 minutes, but it was it's just really an interesting circumstance um, in how these people think and what they're really concerned about. Uh, uh, going forward. A, a, a couple of comments here. Jackie says she's found in large organizations with a lot of communicators, they tend to be assigned to business areas and the opportunities are in those business units to get wins at those levels. That's very consistent, Angela, with what you were saying. Brian uh, asks, how many professional communicators, in addition to Amanda and himself, actually read the Harvard Business Review? Um, because that teaches people about PR thinking. And uh, Jackie thought that was a good point because she works in municipal government. She usually reads mun municipal world and other trade publications. Uh, is, is it important uh, as you're developing yourself as, as an advisor to expand your horizons beyond maybe, you know, the publications for your industry? And I totally you. feel so. Yeah, you you need to read much wider than your own communication world and communication publications, and uh, you know uh, a publication like Harvard Business Review it covers such a wide range of topics. And if we want to be able to to have a credible conversation with a CEO, we need to understand. Uh, the things that's being discussed in publications like Forbes and Harvard Business Review and publications like that. When I was working for Alexander and Alexander Consulting Group uh, back in the um, the mid nineties, uh, I read I was reading the Harvard Business Review and there was an article in there about mapping employee influence networks, uh, which. Mm -hmm. Communicators certainly weren't talking about in the mid '90s, but I was able to take that uh, concept mm -hmm. and apply it directly to a client engagement very successfully. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, I, mean, I think it's it's really important to uh, you know, absorb that kind of information. Um, in addition to the the kind of information that you get from people working in other communication disciplines, like marketing, for example. You know, what I are the, think the issue? The issue really is. The need, the need for us all to study leadership, uh, whether you're working, whether you're working with or for a first line supervisor, or you're walking in the the guys uh, fancy up to the top, to the top uh, of the building, um, they're all involved in this uh, activity called leadership, and they're interested in it. And Harvard Business Review, besides the fact that it's read by everybody on the planet. Um, is probably about 80% dealing with communications issues. So it is really, and they tell stories, powerful stories with data 
um, uh, that help you think these things through. And quite often, uh, it, for this for this particular broadcast, one of us found an article in Harvard Business Review, and we refer the rest of the panelists to it on the issue of questions. Uh, the magazine is re is uh, amazing in its ability to cover the things that really truly matter. But so studying mm -hmm. leadership involves studying leadership itself as well as the, the, the components of leadership. One of the things that I, I have developed is a, is a workshop to, for communication people uh, focused on four different kinds of competencies. One's on business and financial acumen. And we spend a lot of time talking about uh, uh, open book management, the, you know, the SRC uh, way of uh, opening the books to everybody. Uh, the second is change management. Uh, the third is leadership development, and the fourth is measurement. Uh, our experience is that with the workshops that we're doing with these areas is that this pretty well uh, encapsulates the kind of needs that they have, and they seem very hungry when they are participating in, in this and learning how ITT Corporation uh, Im improved uh, uh, performance by 65% because they imp improved, uh, they they helped everybody in the organization understand what operate, operating in, uh, operate, <laughs> operating uh, information is about. And so um, one of the things that's important, I think, is make sure that those kinds of uh, competencies are focused on with the, with the communication people. So I think a couple of people have just mentioned data and measurement. I think this is one of the things that we can bring to the table, because if, if an executive is looking for advice from legal counsel, legal counsel can quote case law. If they're asking for finance or IT, they've got bodies of data. One thing that we can have, so it's not just my opinion on communication versus your opinion on communication, is that data. When you do your own research to figure mm -hmm. out with your own audiences, what is it that they do or don't understand? What channels are or are not even available to them? Uh, and even beyond those those big um, stakeholder types of data that you can use in promoting your recommendation, it's also doing research on those executives' communication skills. Because we, we do this a lot. I work with a company called the Grossman Group. They do strategy for leadership communication, and I do a lot of their research for them. And it's really powerful when you have an executive do a self-assessment of how they think they are on various types of communication skills and pick their top five and bottom five as well. And then you have the people who report to them evaluate each of those skills and also pick the top five and bottom five. So what's exciting is when they agree that yes, these are your three best skills that you think are your best skills. But where it's really powerful is where an executive says, well, these are two of my best skills and on their direct reports, they list them as among their worst skills, because that then gets a dialogue going that actually makes a change in the way these executives perform going forward and get more out of their people as a result. Angela, do you also do peers so that you have a 60 degree assessment? Not in this case, but you can do the 360. I find that the having been a vice president in a company, when you get peer assessment from your vice co-vice presidents or other people, there tends to be a lot of politics involved in that, right. and it's not always a, a fair and accurate assessment. Right. I, uh, it's interesting you mentioned politics. Um, the, uh, one of the most frequent questions I get, I presume all of us do, is uh, from senior communicators saying, you know, I, I worked for this, this person for eight years. I like her a lot. I think she's a real straight shooter, but there's some, there's some spaces in her knowledge and spaces of her thinking that I really think she could change. And I may have been making suggestions and I just can't get her to change. What's the magic? What's the secret to getting her to change? Um, and I, I, I've developed over the years what I call the 10 day rule on ideas. Uh, if you suggest an idea and they ignore it or, or actually push it away to some degree, these are adults. They're making the decision consciously. Uh, and, you know, no matter how long you push this idea, if she says no, it's going to be no. So, you know, if she doesn't say yes within, say, 10 days or, or, or if you want to push it, you know, a month, um, find something else to recommend because she's going to see you coming and all she's going to think about is that thing you keep pushing. And some of these ideas, some of these ideas we're talking about pushing them for years. So lay it down after three weeks and find, we're creative people. We can think of a thousand things in a minute. Think of something else to push uh, and maybe you can build your way back to it if you want. Now, the only exception to this is if they're talking about something that's illegal, immoral, monumentally stupid, 
you know, uh, those sorts of things, then find another job, okay? Because <laughs> they're not going to change. <laughs> this is the business I'm in. And I started this business to change people and realized pretty early in the career, one thing you can't change is people. Uh, if they have these kinds of ideas, you know, you're not going to dissuade them from it no matter how eloquent you happen to be. Um, actually, my next book is called um, uh, The Pathology of Leadership and Management Misbehavior. So uh, uh, it's I'll read that. <laughs> uh, but the idea here is, you know, ideas are precious to the owner more than they are to the person who's buying it. Move on uh, if you can't persuade them to do something that's in, even in their own best interest. Yeah, there, there's also uh, and I, a situation in a distribution center where the uh, people were uh, just not doing the kinds of things that they should be doing, and they were uh, pushing for operating income. They were uh, damaging they had about two million dollars in damage in a year. And I asked the uh, the head leader for this operation. I said, "What are these people being incented for? What's the incentive comp look like?" And she went back to her office and came back and she says, I'm embarrassed to tell you this, but but 10% uh, uh, of the incentive is based on safety, 10% is based on quality, and 80% is based on uh, productivity. And she said, looked at me and she said, I, I think I'm getting what I'm paying for. So my point back to Jim is that if somebody continues to resist something, I take a little peek at their incentive comp to see what somebody is trying to get them to do through the comp system. How do you get some somebody to move outside of their comfort zone? You know, I've been doing town halls this way for 20 years. They seem to go well. Uh, we've acquired a business in another country. I'm just going to go over there and do my typical town hall. You as a communicator know that the culture is different and, and that something else would be more effective, but they're very comfortable doing it the way they've been doing it. How do you convince them to step outside of that zone? It's so, really I will, so I will ask them a question. Um, why do you think this will work uh, in another country? Um, how do they actually deal with conversations in that country? Because uh, if you just tell the person, well, the culture is different, uh, we all know they will say, like Jim said, no. It, it will be the same. So I think to, to make them nervous by asking the questions and make them think by asking the questions. And in addition to the, asking the questions, I would give them some information. This is actually what my master's thesis project was on, was how to help leaders who are conducting town halls or all hands in a culture other than their own, understand how to adapt the content of their messaging, the format of the session and the meeting because there's lots of great data out there on how cultures are different on different mm. scales. And many of them will affect this kind of thing. So for example, yeah. we'll say, so you're coming from this culture that's really on the extreme end of uh, direct communication, let's say. You're going to be speaking in a country with very indirect communication where they don't just want the bullet points, they really want to understand the background. They need to understand what's been done before, what the history of this is. They need a lot more detail than that executive might be comfortable providing at home. Or questions and answers. If you're in a very hierarchical culture, which the Americans, Americas are typically not, uh, they might be surprised why they're getting absolutely no questions during the Q&A, but because it might be seen as disrespectful to ask those questions. So they need to, if you can share with them what some of those differences, those very specific differences are, then you can ask the question of, so how do you think we should adapt the message? Or how do you think we should adapt mm. the format of this session? I think they need some of that information. This is one of the most mysterious questions in all of advicedom is how do you get these people to shift their thinking? It's very difficult. And, um, uh, and it, it has to do with the spectrum of experience for the most part in my, in my experience. When you come to work as a young supervisor, young manager, you really are, you're, you're living really, you're, you're working to live for the most part. But the more, the, the more time you put in, the higher you tend to get, the more you're focused on the work itself. And the, the measure, think about, fantasize about getting things done more efficiently and effectively. This is one of the reasons why most employee engagement projects fail, because the, the employee has one definition of employee engagement and the boss has another one and the boss has prevailed and it's all about getting things done. So, you know, with this, all these elaborate programs they have, for example, that the, the, the uh, folks out in uh, Silicon Valley are famous for, 
don't really help a lot when you look at what's going on in their cultures, uh, because they're the, and these are really relatively young people, but they've been so successful so quickly, they've skipped the steps that make them really good companies, but they get a great company with all kinds of problems moving forward. But the real issue is, I think, understanding where people are in their in their work lives. And it's very difficult for these very senior people to think about anything but productivity. Everything is judged in terms of getting the job done, as opposed to earlier years in management where you're thinking about the people and the issues you do, we just talked about here. It's very difficult to shift these people, no matter how good you happen to be. Well, I mentioned the incentive a couple of times, and I, I have had similar experiences, Jim, where people resisted and it was resisted in part because they were being re reinforced to do other things. And until the goal setting process, the incentive comp process was aligned, they're going to continue to do the things they're uh, getting paid to pay for. It's um, it's very just very complex and uh, it's a sort of a cop out sort of thinking, but it's it's it, it's the politics is a part of it. The emotions are part of it. Um, it's quite an interesting and challenging process. Generally speaking, what changes people is not intentional movement, but some some life changing event, some cr catastrophe happens. But even in that case, sometimes with uh, management. Uh, you know, they're, they're just not moving. I think one of the great examples, and not just in the U.S. culture, but all cultures, is this problem we have with sexual harassment of women. You know, this is a an extraordinarily universal problem uh, with a lot of people working on it and working through it, but there's there's a lot of stuff in the middle of, of this which is which prohibits people from taking making the judgments I think most of us would make them uh, take to resolve this issue, or at least take a stab in that direction. Yeah, I once I once uh, heard a CEO speak. Uh, I I believe it was the CEO of Avon, uh, and he said it it was a routine uh, practice for him to visit a factory floor or a plant uh, frontline operation at least once a month because if he didn't he'd lose touch with who these folks were, he would start to think of them in, in this sort of a, a, a amorphous term of this group of children who can't understand complex issues uh, or take bad news. And when he got out there and spoke to them on one-on-one, -on -one, he was reminded that they're all adults uh, and, and they actually can uh, understand complex issues and, and take bad news. Um, so I, I took that message back to the president of the company I was working for at the time and convinced him to go hang out for an hour with uh, one of the frontline uh, craft parts of the organization. He was terrified. He said, these people are going to eat me alive. But they were just so odd that the president had come into their part of the, uh, the building and spent time with them. He said, this was invaluable. I want to do this again. And he never did uh, because he didn't build it into his schedule. He didn't make it a habit. When you are counseling or advising uh, a leader, uh, how do you make the the advice that you're giving stick rather than make it a one-time reaction to whatever issue it is that you're dealing with? Well, I think it would be, would be like what, what Jim does is about to do, is uh, tell a story. Um, it's so interesting how influencing, especially senior people, is done by example, by by important stories involving data and other sorts of things. But basically, it's sort of the drama of making it more than real to help them to give it some longevity and sticking power going forward. I interrupted you, I'm sorry. No, 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 that's all right. I was going to talk about a guy by the name of Don. Uh, he worked at a poultry processing company on the eastern shore of Maryland. And uh, he was a new CEO, had just taken, taken over. And he wanted to go out to one of his largest plants, which he did on the Eastern shore. It was about uh, 2,100 people. And he told me, uh, I called him and I said, how's it going? And he says, well, it's going pretty well. I'm, I'm really spending a lot, uh, got it down, nailed in terms of how I'm gonna do this. And what I've got is a stopwatch. And I come up to people out on the plant floor and I start the stopwatch and I give myself two minutes to talk with him and then I shut it down and I move on to the next person. And I said, Don, 
don't see, talk to another employee until we have a conversation about that. <laughs> he said, why am I doing something wrong? I said, well, maybe not doing something wrong, but let me think of a way that we can talk about another way to do that without the stopwatch. He did. He listened to it. He paid attention. He says, well, I can't believe that they thought that I was trying to hurry through and that I was being superficial. And I said, well, that doesn't matter whether you think that or not. We're going to try a new way. And he did. He was very, very successful with the new way that he did it. He was much more engaging. He listened more than he spoke. And then he got together with the employees at the end of the day or at the end of the ship. Actually, so this is one of my, my greatest failures in history in my career. Um, and I reminded you because it was, it was at a poultry processing plant on the East Coast. Maybe not the same one. But anyway. Yeah. Um, I was I got such a such a such an, a wonderful picture of this place. Um, but the reason I was there was because 2020 had called and 2020 rarely goes places, especially where they slaughter animals um, to do a pleasant story. But so, so I made the suggestion. I, I met with supervisors. I met with a whole bunch of people and they all were so enthusiastic about the plant and the, the, the company and that sort of thing. So I made the suggestion that they that they have 2020 visit with some employees, which they could pick at random and all that sort of stuff. And um, it was a freaking disaster, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> they told awful stories. They got into gangs and they cried. Um, and uh, it was really something. And it turns out I was just totally buffaloed by this outfit. Um, and uh, uh, I, I, to this day, I say I should have known better. but. They told a great story and then told a different story in front of the cameras. Your, your a, question, Shell, on how do you make this a regular thing? If they've done it once and they agree that it was a good idea, at that point, you sit down with that mm -hmm. executive's administrative assistant and look at their calendar. Where are they going to be traveling to for various reasons, industry conventions, client meetings, whatever they're going to be doing. And you start building in other meetings of those communication experiences where they can see and talk with employees or job shadow or whatever. So it's built into their calendar and then they just show up and here's what they're going to be doing. I'd like to throw out a, a, a question about winning uh, because communicators clearly are not the only people providing counsel and advice to leadership. I, I remember an instance when I was at the pharmaceutical company where um, I was con I was doing media relations, among other things, and I was contacted by a reporter who was doing a story on animal testing. Um, and uh, I thought our company had an incredibly positive story to tell. Uh, first of all, in the pharmaceutical industry, you'll never get to human clinical trials without animal data that the FDA can review. So you have to. Uh, but uh, our story was that whereas most pharmaceutical companies uh, start with um, sort of a regular dose of something and then keep increasing it until they see where it causes harm, we would keep reducing the dose so that it had uh, less potential to do harm. And at what point is it no longer efficacious? So I went to leadership and I said, I think we've got a great story to tell. It's different from all of our competitors. We should participate in this story. Um, and the general counsel was in the room um, and said no, because of course the lawyer's job is to minimize risk in the organization. Uh, and the uh, president of the company said, oh, well, okay, then no. <laughs> so, uh, and, and by the way, the story went on to win a Pulitzer Prize. Um, which is neither here nor there. But um, if, if you believe that you're right and somebody is making the opposite recommendation, uh, how do you present your case in a way that is going to uh, prevail? I would start with using the research. Well, and the other, another sorry, way. Uh, I'm sorry, my man. I found eight contacts at research. <laughs> Amanda? Um, <laughs> I, I will Definitely start uh, because you probably know that that other person will resist. You know that the legal counsel will always say no. So um, I will go into the meeting with enough uh, background information, like Angela said, to make a case of why it should not be done that way um, and why the communication approach that I recommend would be the, the better option, S stating research and results that prove that that would be the better option. I had a friend who worked at Bank of America where they first were told they couldn't talk to the media in a particular situation, and they didn't. 
because of legal, a similar thing came up again. And again, he went to the CEO and said, we really have to be able to talk to the media. And again, he said, no, but you know, this went away in two weeks, the last time something like this happened. Well, my friend actually had stopped by finance on the way and was able to tell the executive just how many hundreds of millions of dollars they lost during that two week period. And then the CEO said, no, we need to go to talk to legal and they have to change their minds this time. Data. So losses get people's yeah. attention, no question about that. <laughs> well, uh, we are approaching the top of the hour. I uh, want to let everybody know about next month's uh, Circle of Fellows, which will be on Thursday, January 23rd. It is always the third Thursday of the month at noon Eastern. Uh, our topic will be transparency, uh, which I love. I, I actually co-authored a book on, on communication and transparency. Uh, actually focused on social media and transparency. So um, looking forward to that one. The panel will include uh, Martha Muzichka, uh, Cindy Schmieg, uh, Brad Whitworth, and Jim Schaefer. You'll be back. Uh, I will be back. On the panel for that one. So looking forward to it. Uh, as always, I want to thank Anna Willie for the yeoman-like work she does in corralling a panel uh, for every one of these topics and making sure everybody shows up on time and has all the information they need. We could not do this without Anna. Uh, I'd love to get her in front of the camera one of these days. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I want to thank all of you uh, for taking the hour this morning uh, or this afternoon or, or Amanda this evening, because uh, I know it's nine o'clock where you are. Uh, yes. And um in participating in such an illuminating discussion. Um, I'm very grateful. Thanks. So thank you. Thank until you. thank you, Shaw. So I hope uh, those of you who are watching live will join us again uh, next month. Of course, this will be available as both an audio podcast and a video replay within the next day or two. So um, look forward to seeing everybody next month. Thanks all. Thanks. Bye bye. Yeah. See you. Bye bye. Bye.